Listen up or run for cover. Dropping knowledge from the people who have it to the people who need it. The, the, the real Robin Bradley Bombs. is dropping. What it is, Bradley, back again with another episode of Dropping Bombs. Today in the studio, folks, I got Matthew Januzak. What's happening, Matthew? How you doing? Now, for those of you that don't know Matthew, he's the co-founder of Escape Fitness Equipment, which is probably in a million plus gyms and organizations and people's closets. No, just joking. <laughs> you're main. You're mainly in the big. You know the big gyms and you know uh lifetime um equinox all the big fancy ones so you're the equipment manufacturer yeah yeah we're in most mainly commercial like we do you know probably there are probably products of ours on uh in people's closets but predominantly it's it's b2b ufc gyms absolutely yeah you know anytime snap crunch all of them or and if, and if not all of them most of them absolutely most of the good ones yeah the good ones <laughs> and so but but you're the manufacturer in other words you you create the equipment that they're using to do personal training and and get people ripped that's right yeah we design the equipment we manufacture it and then we we sell it either directly or through distributors in other parts of the world is it all like um the stretchy ropes and stuff or is it actual equipment we call it functional training so it's it's a lot of the stuff you'd use if you're doing group training or personal training so everything from weights ropes boxes you know frames it's it's everything apart from the the cardio machines we don't really do anything on that side of things do you use smith machines we we don't so any anything that's kind of fixed resistance or cardio that's not really our bag it's it's what we call functional training so things that train you to, to move as your body should move really as opposed to being in a machine which is kind of very restrictive you know you, you don't normally move controlled by something you know you move fairly freely so that's pretty much what we do and you started this in 98 yeah it's it's a long time ago so just over 20 years uh, Who, who's who's richard richard's my father excellent yeah. yes you know it's funny that you say that because I, I i was trying to remember who was in here his I think his father invented the Smith machine. Really? And they called it the Smith machine because this guy's name is Smith. <laughs> and most people say, no, really. No, really. It's, 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 uh, it, it, he told me the whole story. But the Smith machine is like, you know what the Smith machine Absolutely, is? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Like, dude, the Smith machine is named after Smith. That's did you did you know that? I I didn't know. I always always wondered why it was called the Smith machine, but now I know. And you you actually met the son of the guy who it invented it. It was either the son or the nephew, but there was a story, and it was a legit story, because <laughs> um, I looked it up. But uh, this guy was running around uh, in the beginning of the world. I think Joe Joe Gold or you know somebody at one of the clubs, you know, he was trying to sell the machine to, and so he goes in there and places it in there for a few days and the guy comes in and he says go get your smith machine and move it over there and it wasn't even called the smith machine but the guy's the guy was smith something smith so he's like you know go grab that smith machine and get it over there and they just called it the smith machine it's crazy but i'm but the reason i'm asking is because man i want to buy good quality stuff for my house i'm tired of going to a gym it's just i'm a time guy and if i have to get up get dressed get in my vehicle drive down to the gym do what i do at the gym drive back home the drive there the drive back and a little bit of in between man that's 30 40 minutes i could probably save if i could just get up in my skivs walk out the whole nine just get just get get rocking right of my house yeah yeah I mean, I, but but good but but good equipment yeah. Yeah. Well, we can certainly talk about it afterwards, but I, I think you're right. You know, I, I think it's really important. <clears throat> One of the things, you know, I've, I've worked out for over 30 years and, you know, as I started my business, I began to realize how important fitness is. You know, you think about it. Oh, okay. Well, I need to do it. I need to keep in shape. But one of the things I don't think people realize is how sort of how it affects you know, you're mentally as well and your ability sure. to be a very good business owner or entrepreneur, because, you know, you compare, you know, I, one of the, one of the clients that we work with talks about, you know, if you're a, if you're in the NFL, 
you know, if you think about how many hours they're on the field playing their game, I, I, I think he worked it out, you know, in a season, it probably equates to like three, three days worth of playing time and about 16 hours worth of actually activity. And if you look at how much training they do as a, you know, pro, pro NFL sports, you know, athlete, and then think about business people, you know, 330 days a year, they're on it full speed ahead, having to make decisions, having to lead people, influence all kinds of stuff. And how much time do you actually put into the thing that's driving that machine, you know, the, the money maker, and, and it's very little. And, and so I, su- I suppose, you know, being able to, you know, fit exercise or workout into your day is extremely important. So, you know, whether that's having something in the office or at home, or however it is, you know, you really need, you know, it's probably one of the most important things you can do as an entrepreneur is to be able to sort of get, you know, your fitness and nutrition right if you want to be successful over a long period of time. That bomb you just heard, that means you're dropping bombs. <laughs> and it, because it's the truth, man, and people need to pay attention to that. A lot of times, you know, people ask me, how do I get ahead and how do I win and how do I succeed and how do I make more money? And nobody talks about get your fat ass in shape. You know, you get more energy and it gets you more this. And, you know, at the end of the day, man, fitness and health is more important than money. Yeah. Because if I said to you, listen, I'm going to give you $30 billion, but you're going to be bedridden, nauseous, and not even able to move. You're not going to want the money over that. Nah. You put, you want everybody knows that health and fitness is better. Now, again, I might take a billion dollars and be a little chunky. But as far as health goes, health, energy, vitality, that's the most important thing. That way you can run around with your kids. You can go on trips. You can make decisions. So, folks, you guys better pay attention to that. So in 98, you and your dad, says your bio here says you turned your passion into a business. Why was it your passion? Were you already fit back then or something? Yeah, I was a junior bodybuilder. Ah. Um, I was uh, daytime working for my grandfather in a dental business. And in the evenings, I was uh, working in nightclubs on the door as a security. And I, I kind of did that. One, because I weren't earning a lot of money at the time. And two, it kind of gave me a way to go out, meet girls um, without having to pay any anything for it. So I kind of I was doing that at the time. And, and also, it was an opportunity to be around other bodybuilders. Um, so so you know, I bummed around in my in my teens. And then as I got a bit older, I thought I need to you know, come up with some kind of career because I'm, I'm not really heading anywhere. And so I, I sort of, I was in the gym sitting on the corner of a bench press in between the sets. And, um, remember sort of looking over at this, these weights in the corner and, um, and I, I, it, it sort of got me thinking about this this um, conversation my father and I had because he, he was from Poland and he always had a belief that you know Poland was going to be a country which was going to open up. You know, at the time, it was a communist country and you couldn't really trade with it. And he had a, had this vision that the country was going to go open up and there would be an opportunity to do business there. And on the side of these big weight plates, it had Poland. And I sort of went home that evening. I said, I've just seen these plates in the gym from Poland. And I remember you telling me about how Poland is a good country to do business with. If you could find these, I'll go and knock on doors of gyms and sell weight plates. And that was, for me, that was my passion. I just wanted to be in and around the gym business. And my father was an engineer and he wanted to make stuff. And so it gave him an opportunity to leave what he was doing um, over time and me to leave what I was doing. And we kind of combined those two and we managed to to get a business started in his spare bedroom of his of his house at the time. Where is that at? That was in a little place called Yaxley, which was in just outside a place called Peterborough, in a, a place called Cambridgeshire, which is probably somewhere that most people have heard. Um, and it's a tiny little village, kind of in the middle of nowhere, uh, like a farming community. So uh, now, when you now <laughs> when you guys from from London say village, village is that like us saying it's town or a city? No, no. Like when a, you say village, it makes it sound like you know somebody's pulling a old wagon down the road with a donkey. Yes, what that's you it. You've got it. <laughs> what, what do you mean? You just had a village? Yeah. So, that, so that it's basically like a, a kind of like a farming community. So it's probably like somewhere in the no sticks. WalMarts. Not really. It's no like a little place, a corner shop. Um, you know, maybe a fuel station, a bunch of houses, and lots of farm and animals. And you know, that's uh, so how of, was it growing up in that? It was 
it was you know, like when I was a, a young kid, it was you know, we had a great time. We'd be out, no just money though. Play outside. We had no money, no, we, yeah. So, but we so, didn't know we didn't have any money, if you know what I mean. I had a sure, good, good I family, agree. dude. I did the same thing, but my question is, is the listeners to this, a lot of them are entrepreneurial, and it's like what I'm trying to demonstrate is, dude, you live in not a town, not a city, but a damn village <laughs> in the middle of the freaking wherever uk so i imagine it's all gray and rainy most of the time <laughs> yeah and now of. you got a big multi-million dollar international business doing business with all the big gyms which gets you around all the celebs and the name brands and you were and you and you were in a village well yeah so so if you can do it from a village pretty much everyone else would just stop the excuses and quit making them and start doing biz so so because that's what happened yeah. Well, there was one thing that I didn't mention. So I, I was also, I didn't like school. School didn't like me. I was very disruptive. Um, so I, I kind of left very early. I left before I finished. I did one exam, which was in woodwork and metalwork, because that was something that I was excited about. And I made, and the only reason I did it is I made a set of squat stands. You know, when you do the you squats on a bar, I made some squat stands and I made an adjustable bench for my garage at home. So I had a little home gym. So that was my motivation. See, to go. you had a home gym. <laughs> Damn. But apart from that, I had no no kind of qualification. So I'm not that I'd recommend that to anyone. But um, you know, I didn't kind of have the best uh, start in this field. I didn't, you know, I didn't go to university or anything like that, which um, you know maybe could have been a good thing to do. So you and your dad, you're 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 saying, hey, I'll go sell these plates. So he started making the plates, or did he go source them to begin with? Yeah, he went and he went. Um, his his parents were Polish, so he kind of brushed up on his Polish because he hadn't, you know, hadn't lived there and he hadn't spoke it for many years. So he got on the phone. We spoke to some long lost aunts and uncles and relatives, and you know, managed to find a factory that was making this. And uh, yeah, he he sourced them originally, and we we brought them in. I always remember my this kind of huge lorry reversed up this little street in the village, and um, and it had all these like olympic plates on my mom and it and we, were, we had this little tiny house you know at the time and my parents did and it, and it reversed up the street and it wanted to offload all these weights and i remember my mum calling me panicking saying you need to come and sort this mess because <laughs> they wanted there's is a lorry from poland with with some weights but um but yeah we sourced the weights and then over time you know we we got involved in manufacturing you know my father said well look, you know we can we should make them better so we started to design them and make them ourselves over, over a period of time so you so do you believe being able to adapt and adjust is key in growing a business? Yeah. Well, one of the things that people talk a lot about is, you know, how to get started and grow a business, which is really important. You know, that's the first part of it. But, you know, as you know yourself, once you're there, suddenly things just start. You know, you don't start a business and make a load of money and then it's over. You know, we've been going 20 years and I think one of the one of the also the most important thing is to be able to sustain a business over that time because you know in this day and age things are changing so quickly that you know your best product of you know two years ago is no longer relevant today so you have to be constantly adjusting adapting to what the market wants in order to stay in business because otherwise you know you're going to be gone as quick as you start you ain't lying <laughs> i've been 20 years my damn self <laughs> yeah. with lightspeed vt wow isn't that crazy it's People amazing. are like, man, dude, you know that like, I don't know the statistics. There's something like out of all businesses that get started, only 10% last longer than a year. <laughs> and then out of the 10% that last longer than a year, only 10% of those last longer than 10 years. Wow. So, so we're beating the shit out of the odds. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. And, and I always think to myself, really? Well, who... Man, there must be some shit I don't know because, like, I've accidentally succeeded this this long. Yeah, I'm no genius. I grew up in a small town, not a village, but a small <laughs> town. Freaking dropped out of high school at 16. Freaking figured, you know, hey, I probably should build this. It's <laughs> going to be helpful to people, and you know, it, boom. Next thing you know, 20 years, I'm still in business. Now, I think it might be because I'm just a great salesperson. I sold a lot of people along the way. How how big uh, has sales or the ability to sell and close and persuade? How how has it helped you in business? Yeah, it's it's been extremely important. I, I think I I use the word I suppose influence because you know you're 
as a business leader, you're influencing customers, you're influencing suppliers, you're influencing the people who work for you. So one of the things when we started, you know, we didn't have any cash. So we're in the we're in the distribution business. So we were buying products and we were selling products. And the first barrier that we realized is, you know, I, I remember coming back to my dad saying, look, I've just got this fantastic account, you know, like it's going to be worth a lot of money for us. And so I was really proud. Um, but then as the conversation went on with this client, they said, oh, obviously, you know, you're going to give us 30 days. And we're like, what do you mean? It's like, well, yeah, you know, if you deal with us, we need terms, you know, we're not going to pay you for every order. And I, we had this kind of dilemma, my dad and I, it's like, okay, well, there's this great opportunity, but how are we going to fund it? Because we've got to buy it from a supplier who wants to be paid. And then we have to give them credit. And we, you know, we had a few thousand pounds, which, which wasn't a lot, you know, we were juggling everything. And we, you know, we managed to kind of, influence the suppliers at the time to kind of give us certain terms and and the people that were we were selling to we 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 managed to influence them to flex a little bit and and because of that we managed to get the business going so i think you you know you've got sales in terms of convincing somebody to buy you something but you know there's there's a lot of other areas as well and i think you know if you can be a good influencer able to communicate able to understand the needs of other people and uh, and align that then i think you know it's a really important skill for anyone to have even hmm. if you're not in sales yeah well i would agree with that a thousand percent so what are you out doing now like for example you're not still knocking on doors selling plates are you <laughs> no well i i i guess i one of the things i like to do is i'm still very in touch with the market, the customer. Because yeah, you're so, in like 80 countries, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm out to I'm out in Bangkok next week at a big event, and I'll be meeting customers. I'll be talking to them. I'll be asking them questions. I won't directly be selling to them, but I'll be, you know, working with our sales teams on that side. So so I guess for me as a leader of a business, you know, I I feel, you know, you can either be a leader who just sits in a room and you know, lets other people do that. Or you can be sort of out, you could be the face, you could be talking to people. And, you know, my style is I, I want to be out in the market. I want to know what's going on. I want to be talking to the people that are buying the product and not just the owners of the company. You know, I want to be talking to the people on the ground floor, what they think, because these are the guys and girls that are really on the cutting edge. You know, they know stuff and problems before the owners of the company know the problems. You know, the people who work... Well, that's because they're the ones so causing them. Well, yeah, you could say <laughs> <laughs> a lot of cases. Just joking. But, you know, if you came into our business, you know, some of the people that are doing the day-to-day -day stuff know, probably know more about the business than I do. Sure. And, 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 you know, that's a lot of the situation with our customers. So, you know, I want to make sure that we're not just talking to the people who are running it, but the people who are working in it. And I think that makes us as a company more responsive and more able to kind of be you know, anticipate where the market's going next. So basically, user feedback's key. Yeah, absolutely. Because the person running the gym is not the one using your equipment. Mm -mm. So they're just saying, hey, yeah, yeah, and then the ones using your equipment, they're the ones saying, hey, man, the, the handle's too short, or man, these things are too heavy to move. It'd be great if they were this. Yeah. And then you just keep modifying and adjusting the equipment based on user feedback, and you stay up cutting edge yeah and and you know it's an interesting thing about innovation and being at the cutting edge because you know we have this conversation a lot as a company innovation is 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 key to our business but with innovation you know I've, we've learned the hard way you can be too innovative you can be too ahead of the curve and the problem is is you probably know this quite well what you do you know if you're too ahead of the curve you're you know there's there's two risks one is that you have to invest a huge amount of money to educate people that this is a problem they don't even know that they've got at the same time, unless you've got a lot of, you know, behind you to, to fund that education, people can look at what you're doing, adapt and come on quite quickly and overtake you. Yeah. Um, or you can just, you know, it's just you're three or four years too, too, too far ahead of everybody else and it never happens. So, you know, you just got to be on the cusp of innovation so that people are, you know, you're just ready for them when they're about to take that next step. And that's very difficult to, you know, I don't know whether you can write a book about it, but if, unless you're in touch with the market, you can't get that feeling for where you need to be. Yeah. Well, I was at least 10 years ahead of my time. <laughs> Some people say 20. I mean, when I, when I created this company, Nobody was training online. Internet was barely out. <laughs> I started knocking on doors saying, hey, listen, let me show you how you train online. They're like, what? I'm like, dude, you got to train online. Da, 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 da. It's like it took me five to eight years before I really got anyone to even do it. 
and then another five to eight years for them to actually agree that, yeah, I guess it is better. And now, 20 years later, boom, everyone's like, we should be training online. <laughs> well, no shit. <laughs> and, and not only that, people are just now, well, you know, we should be using videos, not voice over PowerPoints. <laughs> well, no shit. And guess what? In another five years, people are going to go, hey, and these videos should be able to be interactive to where they can adapt. <laughs> no shit. So it'll be 20, 25 years, and that's a little bit too innovative. Yeah. Meaning, dude, most people wouldn't survive. If I wasn't such a unstoppable rhinoceros-minded force, I would have given up, dude. How do you go eight years making no money? How long did it take you guys to start making any loot? Well, you, you kind of hear these stories of people that come up with an idea and then, and then suddenly, you know, their things change and their life change and everything's great. You know, for us, it was always, it was always just this slow and hard, like, like climbing a mountain. You know, you're moving up, but every step you're pushing, you know, yeah. you're pushing, you're working, you're pushing. And so, so it, you know, it took a long time. You know, the first few years, my dad and I had two jobs. We, we did our day job. We did this in the evening. Then I left the day job um a man you know we managed to create enough cash flow to pay my salary then like a year and a half my dad was able to leave what he was doing and he came on board and then we you know we got family members first you know my brother sister mother they all kind of started part-time then full-time so you know it was a number of years before things happened and then you know we we grew and then market changed and we went down and we adjusted and went up so it's been a you know it's kind of like this zigzag and and he said you know it's an upward trending zigzag but it it wasn't a sort of an overnight success <laughs> what about like we got anything um proprietary yeah, big Cause, part. Because can I walk in and be like, oh, shit, that's a cool little device they, they're making there, and then just go into my smoldering factory? What do they call them? Where uh, you make the steel? Uh, yeah. like Smelter? Uh, Smelter? A, a foundry or something. Yeah, a foundry. Yeah. Yeah. Can't, can I go into my foundry and pound out the same thing you're doing? You can. And, and so in our in our business, that's been a real challenge. And so we, we from a very, very early day we days, we kind of, really considered about you know intellectual property understanding the importance of being able to get some form of protection on what you do because we were designing nice products and then you know we'd go to a trade show and with a couple of weeks you know the chinese n nothing not call out our chinese friends I'll, but i'll call them out <laughs> freaking chinese hey there's nothing wrong with the people no. but at the end of the day it's the rules they know there's there's nothing we there's, can do exactly. so they just copy everything and yeah. and by the way i mean I would imagine there's a lot of Chinese inventions that get copied by other Chinese people yeah. because of the rules there. Yeah, there's, there, there isn't any rules. So the way we, what we learned over time, and we tried to sue Chinese companies and lost thousands and thousands over you it. You can't. We, yeah, it's, it's impossible. So what we learned is we, we, would, we would get some form of protection in the key markets around the world, and then we would go for the big fish. So if, you know, if anybody that was a serious competitor would copy it, then we were going to action because I had more to lose. Than, so you protected everything we, with, we protected with copyrights, everything. patents, what? Pat, cop, main, mainly patents, design registrations. Those were, those are the two things we, we use on a product side. Um, so let's go back to Smith machines. Yeah. I know hammer strength makes a Smith machine. You heard of hammer strength? Yeah, we work with those guys. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I I don't know all the gym equipment because I'm rarely in one other than <laughs> the fitness 19, but you know, it's, uh, you know, I forget the name brands of them, but I've seen a hundred different Smith machines. How come someone didn't, couldn't protect that? Well, it, it, I think it's around about 25 years that a pattern stays in. So, you know, and I don't know whether it, Mr. Smith actually got a pattern. You know, a couple of things. If you come up with an idea and then you take it to a trade show and it's not protected, then you can't protect it. It's, it's you know, people have seen it. It's too late. So you've got to, you've got to really understand how to play that game. So if you've got an idea, you need to kind of protect it first. And then you've got a period of, I think it's about 20, 25 years, maybe different in each country's to keep that. So that Smith machines have been around for a long time. So my guess is, you know, similar to the, have you seen like the concept two rowers, mm -hmm. you know, that's been around that patents now expired. It's been out for a certain the, amount the, of time. The, the, like you're rowing a boat. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. That sort of thing. So you can, you've got a window of opportunity to, to fight things off and then it, it just opens up. But you know, normally that window's big enough to, to, to get established in the market. I've, I've, in, I've invented in my head a piece of equipment that I think would, be the most popular piece of equipment in any facility on the market really well don't tell us online tell me I, offline and i'll <laughs> I, 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 the name is the spider 
The spider. And I'll explain offline. Okay. It's the spider. Like everybody would have a row of spiders. Wow. I'm I'm very interested now. You've got you've got my attention. Well, have you ever seen <laughs> have you ever seen the movie The Jerk? The Jerk. I don't think I have. It's a long time ago. If you if it, you should rent it, it's funny. But Steve Martin. Oh yes, I have. Yeah. Yeah. His name's Norbert or some shit. Yeah, like that's that. a great. Yeah. So he says, you know, the guy comes in and his glasses. Yeah, but the, so the glasses them. that flip up. And they no, it's go. got a thing. right. Oh, there. that's right. And they go cross-eyed. Makes him go cross-eyed. So he gets sued. So he loses it all at the end. But but the guy says, you know, if I do any of these things, I'll send you some money. And it was just billions of dollars. So I'll tell you what the spider is because I don't think I'll ever do it. Right. And I would want these to be made just so I could have one. Yeah. Because if I had a spider, I could, I, number one, it'd be awesome. Number two... I wouldn't. I wouldn't need a gym. Now right. that that's why maybe you won't won't make one because what if no one needs gyms? But but dude, you had a billion spiders in every wow, household in the country. That's so good. Like Peloton, dude, they're killing it. Yeah, you you've heard of Peloton. Yeah, they're they're they're, they're doing well. I don't think they've made money for a while, but their valuation, a potential valuation, is is pretty crazy. Well, uh, dude, their 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 equipment's cool. Yeah. But but really, I believe it or not, invented that. 20 years ago my buddy troy we grew we were we grew up together he bought a, a gym he owned um a bunch of gold's gyms after a while but anyway when we first started he bought this little gyms called delps his dad bought it for him we were all in high school but you know his dad bought him a gym well he turned that gym into four and seven and then 12 and then he sold them and he was rich then he bought these and didn't he's still in the business good friend of mine still so like i told him a long time ago about like why don't you have like a screen on a bike where you know people can just watch the trainer and that's ultimately what a peloton is isn't mm -hmm. it and yeah. then i'm like and then i'm like dude why can't i ride the bike and look like i'm cruising around famous spots like you know hmm. or race people and dude that's ultimately what it is yeah i i, I, I and you're right and the, the interesting thing about that as a as a conversation as a subject is that you know, I've seen several of these things over the years. There was a product called Real Rider that Reebok got involved with um, probably about 10 years ago. And there's been several versions of this. You know, this isn't totally new and innovative, but I think, you know, part of it is how you execute. Timing is a big thing, as we talked about earlier. You know, you've got to kind of have the right timing. And I think sometimes some of those products maybe have been a bit too soon and then how you execute how you wrap and package it and and so you can have all these great ideas which a lot of people have and think okay well you know i had that idea and i could have made myself a billionaire but but there's also other parts to it and and so i think it's it's not just having a great idea it's how you implement execute sell and market them and we've had some great ideas but we've been you know have been poorly executed and haven't worked and and vice versa, you know, simple things that have made us a lot of money. Well, as I'm chit chatting, I notice, and let me point out again, your escape, f escape fitness equipment. And if you guys are interested in like looking at some of the things, if you guys own gyms uh, in the fitness industry, want to check out this dude's stuff, just go to escapefitness.com and you can find him. Or you can go to Instagram and find him at Matthew. Janicek, and I'll let you look. It's M A T T H E W J A N U S Z E K. That's correct. Matthew Janusek. Um, at Instagram, Facebook, same thing. Matthew Janusek Escape. But I notice it's Escape Fitness. So it's like the word escape brings me a whole bunch of more ideas now do you want me to talk about them now or do you maybe maybe they're going to be so good you'd rather hear them offline <laughs> because dude well, the difference between it is most people won't do shit anyway i could tell them the thing right now and they won't do shit about it i've done it before where i've given people the idea and they didn't do shit and then Eight years later, somebody did it and somebody's rich. And I said, remember when I told, said about that? They're like, yep, this little device right here. You ever see these? Oh, right. Yeah. Dude, if I gave you one of these, you'll never, like I literally will change my phone before I change this. <laughs> like, like when the iPhones came out with the glass on the back, this, this wouldn't stick. And I was about to go get a different phone so this could stick. That's how valuable these are to me. And, and anyway, uh, 
I didn't invent this, but I, I mean, I did, I don't own this company, but I did invent this way before this person did. And coincidentally enough, they've came in, they were on the podcast and I told them, I said, dude, I thought of this a million years ago. And, and the difference is, is you did too after me, but you did it and I didn't. Yeah. So that's the difference. You can do it, man. You're in the business. So I tell you a good idea. You can make a phone call and do it. Most people listening won't, but the escape fitness, just the word escape. I've always thought like the, any type of piece of equipment, man, if you just attach a game to it. So let's say for example, um, you are a, you can pick, you're the burglar or you're the cop. So I snatch a lady's purse in a park and now this piece of equipment, I have to escape the police. And trust me, this piece of equipment is basically just a treadmill or whatever with a video monitor and I just got to escape and it's a game. Um, and I know you said you don't really mess with the cardio thing, but maybe, maybe you could cause escape fitness, you gotta, you have to escape and it's a game. It's just all about in a game. People like games. If I, if I went on a treadmill and, and I was competing with everybody in the same row, it, it would be more fun. Mm. But how come when I go to the gym, these treadmills aren't connected. Well, that's the magic of Peloton. You know, the the difference is it's not just a screen. You know, you are actually competing with other people in the class, but also around the world, which is very clever. That's what I'm um, talking about. It, See, yeah. again, dude, that was my idea. The whole sun coming up in the morning. That was my idea. <laughs> I always say shit was my idea because it was similar. But seriously, that's what I'm talking about, dude. Yeah. Why don't you do something like that? Yeah, I think it's a great idea. You know, I'm, I'm, I represent probably the, a small percentage of people that just enjoy working out. But in reality, 95% of people don't. It's difficult. It's hard. It's, it's painful. And so, you know, having ways to make it more fun and engaging and interesting is what it's about. We, we try and do that with our products. And we look at helping trainers to create fun and engaging classes. But being able to go that next level and... And like you say, you know, create these scenarios where you're actually absorbed in the activity as opposed to, or sorry, absorbed in the experience as opposed to the activity, I think is, is certainly the way to go. Well, yeah, because when, listen, this is just my opinion. When you're a fitness equipment company, you don't have facilities. You, you rely on facilities and you rely on their members. Well, wouldn't you love if everybody walked in tomorrow and said, do you guys have any escape fitness equipment here? No? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to go to a gym that has escape fitness equipment. How would you like that? Yeah, that'd be, that'd be pretty cool. Exactly. Be like then you become huge because people will be calling you, begging you to put your equipment in their facilities because, man, people are coming in. They aren't signing up because I don't have your shit. Yeah, they need a spider, you see. That's what it is. But at the end of the day, dude, listen, it, it, that's a powerful brand. If I walked into a gym and said, uh, hey, how you doing? Hey, welcome. Uh, you want to take a tour? No, I just want to know. Do you have escape fitness equipment? Oh, you don't? Okay, thank you. What, 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 wait, where are you going? We have, we have hammer strength and we have TRX. Is it called TRX, that thing, that big right. rack? <laughs> See, that's my point. Like, dude, I've never walked in and said, hey, I need TRX. But if the trainers, the TRX trainers, get the PT guys to understand how to use that freaking stupid looking rack, and then, a, and then they train their people on the rack and get them, let's say, addicted to a TRX machine, that helps TRX brand. Mm -hmm. That helps the equipment manufacturer. But I've never, ever seen anybody working out on this TRX machine that's in our gym. And it's like, dude, what do you have that thing here? And I'll bet you eventually it'll go away because nobody's using it. Mm -hmm. Why is nobody using it? Because TRX isn't making sure. Why is TRX not making sure? Because they don't have enough people to probably facilitate all of the training and and brand building necessary to train every new hire to every, you know, person that's turning over and eventually they just can't keep up so now there's a machine there that no one knows how to use and guess what it's not going to be there long if that continues so if i were trx or escape or hammer strength or anybody and again if i'm making a bench press dude no one needs and we all know how to use a bench press but what what do you do with those straps on that trx machine someone needs to show me well there's an opportunity i asked someone has an opportunity to pt me escape fitness equipment that's just a cool name it's better than trx why just the name alone escape w why escape why escape well interesting story so when 
when I first <clears throat> decided to uh, start my own business, this was prior to the weights, I had one of these crazy ideas, which was um, I had a girlfriend at the time whose father sold ladies' clothes on a market store. And um, I needed to earn some money. And you know, he had all these shops, lovely, beautiful, convertible Mercedes cars. And I thought, well, you know, he's obviously in the right business, you know. <laughs> so I remember talking to him and saying, like, you know, maybe I can buy some of your clothes and I can sell them. And, and at the t my dad, going back to the early conversation, he kept saying, you know, think about Poland, think about Poland. So you know, I wasn't the smartest businessman, but I thought, okay, well, he's making money with clothes. My dad said Poland. Why don't I buy some clothes from him and sell them in Poland? Okay, so that was kind of like a bit of a, you know, that wasn't one of my best ideas. So I, I had a, had this Jeep at the time and I bought all these clothes, these dresses, these jumpers, drove from England through Amsterdam down to down through Germany into Poland. And at the time you couldn't get in because it was a closed country. You know, you had to get someone to invite you in. Um, gave them a few jumpers to bribe them to allow me to go in. And I, I knocked on the doors of shops and to sell these clothes, which I managed to do. That really tested my sales skills because... Um, I didn't even speak Polish, but we managed to offload all this stuff. And so, so this the escape name was the name for the clothes. It was it was like to escape England, to escape where I was, this little village, to do something better. And then when we when we came up with this fitness idea, we'd already kind of printed the business cards. And you know, I didn't want to print some more business cards. I didn't have a lot of money, so I would just kept the name. And I, when I went to see people with the weights, I gave them the same business cards for the ladies' clothes, and that's that stuck, you know. <laughs> Is that right? That's truth. See, true story. That's funny, man. Have you heard? Have you told that story before? Um, probably not to many people. Probably no. That's that. that <laughs> it was a bit I, of a failure, you know. It wasn't one. I'm one of my proudest moments. Yeah, but that's why people like drop bombs because people always write in to me and they're like, "Dude, freaking love listening to your shit because it's like a conversation." And like, how do you ask the questions you ask? It's like, well, that's, I don't know, <laughs> through conversation. Like, I'm curious, why escape? Well, that's a good ass story. <laughs> um, but the cool, the name's cool. And to me, when I hear escape fitness equipment, it sounds like, what is that? Like, it, you have an opportunity to create a consumer awareness that could drive your brand because... I want escape fitness equipment. I don't want to work out on the normal gym equipment. I want escape fitness equipment. And 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 how you get that awareness and and market demand is to be unique and have a I mean again a, a kettlebell is a kettlebell. Like you know, well we got kettlebells. Well, uh, who cares? Well, who cares what freaking brand of kettlebell it is? Well, we teach you how to use the kettlebell. It's a kettlebell, dude. I don't give a shit who's making the kettlebell. Just give me a damn good kettlebell. But if you go in there with a piece of equipment that only Escape Fitness has and it ties to a game of some kind or some sort of thing where I want that equipment because it's fun for me or it's, you know, I enjoy the workout better or whatever. So whether it's a spider or whether it's a piece of equipment that, you know, you're running from the cops because you just stole a person. I know that's a bad analogy. You can come <laughs> up with a better one, but you're escaping someone after you. Have you ever ran from somebody? Yes. So have I. <laughs> and trust me, dude, if they keep chasing, dude, you're still running. You're not stopping. So if you could incorporate some sort of fun to where like the whole point of this piece of equipment is to escape, dude, I think you'd have a big smash on your hand because people love playing games. People love competition. And when I hear escape, I'm, I'm always thinking like, what, what, what is it? Like I'm, 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 ass I'm assuming it's something, you know, cool because mm -hmm. obviously you're successful. So people are, must be liking your equipment, but escape, that sounds like freaking a game. That sounds like fun. That sounds like something I want to do. Right. What, 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 what do you have? What kind of equipment do you manufacture? So we will do. We'll do everything from a lot of the strength and conditioning. We do kettlebells. See, we do what's that? I don't get it. Why, do. why, why would I buy an escape kettlebell as opposed to a kettlebell kettlebell? Yeah. And well, by the way, is there another brand? There, there's, there's other ones out there. Like we, we focus from a product side, which is part of you know one part of our solution. But we, we always you know, designs a really key part of what we do. So we'll, you know, when we first started, we would take basic 
dumbbells and weight plates that have been around for years with, with, where there's no design added to them. And we just make them look a bit sexy. You know, we'd add some color. So you're like we'd the add apple some of weight plates. So, so yeah, we'd make the stuff look cool and sexy. And it was amazing how many brands at the time just took what was from China, sure. no, no thought on design. You know, look at your, your, you know, your laptop in front of you. It looks cool. You know, you've got a nice little Apple thing. So we would just style things. And that was always, you know, the, that was the first thing that we did to differentiate ourselves from everybody else. In a lot of businesses, people tend to look at what someone else is doing and they'll say, well, I, I'm a, you know, I'm similar to those or I do what they do, but I'm a bit cheaper. And their whole kind of business proposition is based on copying someone else, but doing it cheaper, which, you know, is not really a strategy. And then if you ever head to head someone, you're, you know, you're always the copy version. So we've always tried to say, look, you know, we want to do whatever we can to be in our own space, you know. So if you see an escape product, you'll know it. You know, like you mentioned off camera, you know, you've, that stuff was recognizable. You'd seen it before. If you see, our, we've got these big, sort of tires that are colorful and made out of foam they don't mess up your gym gear you know my mum can pick them up she feels cool using it and, it, and it's fun colorful exciting equipment and and it doesn't look like anything else that's on the market yeah. and and you know so that's one of the things that we always try and do you know why don't we, you know lead do something different rather than trying to do a cheaper cop knockoff of what's out there. Uh, that's well, well, now that you have your core business and your and your brand is recognizable and and everybody loves you, now you might be able to afford to experiment because you don't need the money. Now you can just like toy around with something. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. So, dude, it's it's a great it's a great idea. Though. It's something I you know something I hadn't really thought of, but I, I like where you're going with it. And you can play play off the escape, dude. Yeah. Like, dude, I, I want to go to a gym. Like, I would be there at 6 a.m. If, hey, if if, if if escape started at 6, I'm going to be there at 6. Sometimes I'll get in there about 6.20, 6.30. Why? Eh, you know, who cares? I'm just going to get on a treadmill. I'm going to go hit the weights. I'm going to get out of there. But, dude, if like it's almost like a group X out on the gym floor. Right. Like, like escape. Escape starts at 6 a.m. You better be in there because you can't play until – you know, every, all the machines are going to be taken anyway. Yeah. Would you ever make a machine? Uh, maybe if it was the right, we, if it fitted into kind of our belief about working out. And uh, what is your general. belief about? Working well, out? most of what we do is about free movement. It's we, it, the term is functional training, but it's about moving in a way that your body was is naturally designed to move and being able to enhance that movement. So even as you get older like i am now I, w I still want to move like i was when i was 20 my body you know i want to function i want to have that strength that that power that cardiovascular strength and and i you know rather as opposed to having a machine that's kind of compensating for me i want to move as my body was intended so everything that we design is to is to enhance your ability to do that whether you're at the elite athlete level and you're doing it for a sport or whether you're someone like my mum that just wants to be in you know in tip-top shape to keep up with the grandchildren and and everything that's in between you know that's our philosophy so yeah machines have their place it's not in our range but you know certainly. well you never know you never know. I do know that you're you're in a lot of different top tier uh, facilities. Is that because your design's so kick ass? Yeah, I, I think we focus on great designs. We what we provide is is you know they're legitimate concepts, and uh, we really focus on the quality. You know, there's a lot of stuff we could do, and we could make a lot cheaper by shipping it off to Asia. But you know, I. I use the gym. I use the gym a lot and I know how, you know, the cheaper stuff will perform over time. So I'd rather say, look, you know, okay, we're not for everybody. Not everybody can afford us, but I know that I can go into one of the gyms with our equipment, you know, a year, two years time and it still look good. You know, it still reflect the brand because, you know, I, I am the brand, you know, I don't, I, if, if you had a gym, I don't want you to come and see me in 12 months time, we bump into each other and you say, oh, I brought that stuff in me and it's fallen to pieces. Yeah. You know, you know me that it's, it's not a, good thing to have you know i want you to say you know i've got your equipment it's bloody awesome you know and i want to come back to you again and that's a that's a, you know in business it's a tough decision because you turn away a lot of business and the, profits the, yeah the bulk of the market it's very easy just to go out and say like let's copy what escape have done let's do it a bit cheaper source it in china it's not quite as good but let's do that and make a bunch of money and you can do it um and we you know we know we give away a lot of business because we're not prepared to do that but 
you know, I'm in this game long term. I love what I do. And, um, you know, I want to, I want people to tell them how great they think our products are, as, as I'm sure you do with your products. You know, you want people raving about how good your, you know, your system and solutions are, I would have thought. Absolutely. And design's key too, because I was wondering, like, I wonder what's the big difference. But when you said yours looks better, dude, I go into the gym sometimes and I see the old iron. I don't know if it's iron or steel, but it's the big heavy ass plates that look the same in every gym you go to, even if they're, they're not the same, they're the same. And then you see the freaking well-designed, you know, better looking things in life. And yeah, that's what people want. Mm. That's probably what started you being the, 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 that's probably what started the success for you is you went in there with a better design, more functional, more quality. And that's why when you look at your client list, you're in a lot of the, like David Lloyd, that's high end, right? Yeah, most we. That's is there a, is most there a of a Barton, clients. Dave Barton, or David Barton? Yeah, I, th I think I'm not sure if they're around anymore, but um, there is a David UFC Barton over here. Fitness yeah. First, 24 Hour Fitness. Who else? Yeah. Now you're testing me. We're, we're, we're in. We'd be with Snap, and we've we've been a lot of in the, you know independent gyms. Um, they want quality stuff. That's why they're buying yeah. from Escape. And it's about the experience, you know, look at this studio here, you know, you could have probably done this for half the price, but it wouldn't, you know, it, it wouldn't have been the same experience. You know, you've got good quality mics, you've got, you know, your, your design of this, it's, you know, someone's spent time and thought about, it, which is probably why you're one of the leading podcasts there is. And people, when they look at it, they think this, you know, this guy, even if they don't know you, they think this is a serious dude, you know, he's done it properly. <laughs> and I think, Would they be wrong? <laughs> And I think in any in anything in business, you know, you want people, even if they don't, before they know you, when they step in and they, you know, see your business, whether it's how you dress, your business card, you know, when I when I first did a trade show, we had this, we couldn't afford a booth, you know, we had like a three meter by two meter, which is sort of like six foot by four foot, small space, but and and it was it was the smallest one on there. But you know what we did is I put all the money I had. I, I kind of created this crazy suit that I wore because that was really the only thing I could do. And I had this had these friends of mine, you know, make this really wacky suit that would stand out. And everybody said, "Who's that weird guy in the in, in the suit?" And you know, my my brochures were really high quality. So even though I even though I was really kind of smaller than anyone else in there you know our philosophy in our business is how can we punch above our weight you know what we can't we can't outspend our competition you know i can i couldn't do more ads i couldn't have a bigger booth at a trade show but i can out innovate them you know i can be more creative i can get everyone wearing some funky clothes that everyone's going to look at our funky clothes instead of the big booth which i've spent hundreds of thousands and i think in business you've got to you've got to be able to do that and and the and the presentation and the first impressions is is really important and you know you don't necessarily have to outspend directly, but you can do it in a, I believe you, you need to do it in a slightly different way. Yeah, that's a good point, man. If you guys are listening out there, folks, you just made a great point. You know, if you can't outspend your competition, and a lot of times, especially when you're a startup, you can't, well, then you better outthink them and you better out uh, be more creative. Like if you go to a conventions to say, you always know, see the booth, the booth, the booth, the booth, what, 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 you know, you're walking past them, they all look the same after a while. You know, you're giving out pens, you're giving out the squishy stress balls, you're giving out. Well, you know what? Figure out how do you stand out, whether it be the hot girl. Now everyone's doing the girls out front. How do you do it? And how do you keep and stay fresh to keep that attention coming? Yeah. Are you the one that does that for the company or is it, or do you have a team now? Uh, yeah, we've got a team. Like I, I, I like to be involved in that side of things. Um, I like to be, you know, making, I, you know, looking at all the different industries, you know, coming here today. You get inspiration from other places and it's like, you know, what can you do without spending a load of money? Because it's very easy, particularly if you're a startup and you've been, you know, given money or you've raised funds. It's easy just to go out and say, right, let's let's you know, let's go to the this company and spend a fortune here. Let's get a big booth. When when you started, I guess like I have and probably like you, is you know, where every penny's your own penny and you've got to make every dollar equate to ten dollars you know a dollar can't equal a dollar if you if you know when you start with yourself it's got to equal 10 so it's like what can you do you know one of the early days when we went to a trade show we we hired these 70s outfits like so i had a wig on this is a fitness show you know i look i was thinking i'm gonna i'm looking totally stupid i had these big flares on and these long jackets and all the guys on the stand were like are you serious and we so we all dressed up in these 70s outfits and we hired a friend of mine had a nightclub 
and we rented a nightclub. We put on a party where we charged people tickets to go in. And everyone in this whole place, all, these, all, the, all of our competitors, everyone went to this party. And we were selling tickets and, and everybody knew about Escape. And, you know, it was a, we were only been it was like two or three years in, but we were on the map. And we did, all we did is got some secondhand 70s costumes, you know, did a deal with the nightclub where he kept the bar and we got free entry. And that's it. And I, I think in business, that's what you've got to do. You've got to, you've got to think outside the box don't look at what everyone's doing in your space and trying to do a, a variation on that you know think totally left field you know come up with something different and that's how i think you can compete against some of the biggest brands in the world what if what if you don't have anybody on your team that does that and you can't do that um well i i, I guess um you know i no one taught me how to do that uh this you know it's just it's some a mindset like, you know you, well again it's like Sometimes I'll get on the phone downstairs in my sales room and I'll close deals for people. And when I get off, they're like, dude, how did you do that? And I'm like, dude, I don't know. I, I, to me, I think it's natural. I think it's, you know, how did you think of that? Well, how did you not think of that? But like when you just said, you know, 70s costume, well, what were you thinking to come up with that? So the party... I like, uh, we, we had a, a convention one time we couldn't afford to go to. It was very expensive to get in the booth. So what someone said is, hey, instead of spending all that money on that, why don't we just do a party? Well, we threw the damn party and same thing. We got a bunch of people to want to go to that party and we closed deals at the party <laughs> and we saved like a ton of money. <laughs> and I thought a party like, dude, because people want a party. So when if you were to say, how did you think of that? Well, the method was, what are what do people want to do well at those conventions they definitely don't want to go booth to booth to booth to booth so booths are kind of a waste of money because i wouldn't want to go to a booth let's see what do i want to do when i go to those conventions well i want to get out of the convention and go to the parties that are that are there and usually it's the big corporate ones or not so let's throw a party it was that easy i mean it just naturally let's throw a party How'd you, what was your method to say 70s and the party and all that? I think we had, I, I got together a few people who, in, who were working in the business at the time and we just, we threw around a few ideas and it kind of evolved. I, I, I don't know how 70s came up. I think it was, uh, I think it was just popular at the time, you know, these 70s parties, people like to go, they like the music. And, um, and then we said, well, look, let's, do the costumes because it was because we you know when we when you go to a trade show you know everyone's got to wear the same t-shirts and then it's like okay well that's going to cost us a bit because we've got to get t-shirts logoed and then it's like well are we all going to wear matching bottoms and we got to buy people trousers and then it was like a fitness show so we were looking at trainers so when i kind of looked at the cost just to do it in a traditional way i thought it's going to cost us a lot of money you know to, to do this the 70s costumes there was loads of secondhand <laughs> places that did it cheaply so Part of it was it was a cheaper way to dress everybody, if I'm honest. Dress um, everyone consistently. <laughs> yeah. So we all look together. Uh, yeah. In this way, we were all different. You know, I had a wig on, I had purple stuff. Someone else had these big, you know, kipper Different, tie. but together. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's key, we're though. We were all 70s, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's brilliant. And, that's and then actually, the funny thing was, on the second day, people were like, where can I get the costumes? And so we got the guy from the costume store to come to the trade show and he brought a van and he was then renting this stuff to the other people on the booth it was it kind of took on a life of its own and you know it's one of those things that just kind of happens and but it's an example of you know using you know creativity within your team to say let's just think out of the box let's just try not to do what everybody does the squeezy stuff you know how many trade you could go to all these different industry trade shows and they're probably all if you have took off the name on the front, they're probably all very similar, aren't they? They're very dry. Everybody's got a big booth, bright lights, you know, kind of guys walking around in suits. They're all the same. You know, there's I no energy. It, there's no fun. There's no excitement. I call it corporate -y. It's very, yeah. oh, we got to be professional. We got to be corporate -y. Oh, hell no, you're not wearing that. We've got to be professional. <laughs> like, I think the opposite like you do. It's all gray. You know, what, it's what, one, one, we had balls at this uh, convention that lit up. <laughs> They're like bouncy rubber balls, you know, and they're see-through and, and the bright lights are in the middle and they turn on when you bounce them. Right. So I noticed at the convention the prior year that uh, there was a guy standing there and he would bounce a ball on the floor and it'd make you want to catch it. 
And then whoever was with it, you know, they'd go like this because they want to catch the ball. So this guy was bouncing them. So I said, okay, we'll do the balls this year. But uh, ours had the flashy light, so they were cool. And then on the printing, we we put Lightspeed VT on one side, and then on the other side, I said I wrote, "We got balls." <laughs> nice. See, people, a, a corporate company would never have done that. No, they're like, "Oh, dude, uh, what if somebody thinks it's like, dude, you gotta, you gotta be cool, you gotta be think outside the box, you got you can't worry, agree or disagree." Yeah, and and the problem when you get bigger is that you, if you're not careful, you can lose some of that stuff. You know, I know certainly we look at ourselves and say, you know, look back at some of the things we did in the early days when we weren't quite as well known and we took a lot of risks. And and you, I think you have to be careful as you grow as a business not to start merging into this kind of vanilla professional organization because you've got these high profile clients and you have to fit in with everything. I, you know, I think you, you've you got to keep that entrepreneurial spirit and, and, you know, take some risks. Okay, sometimes it's going to go wrong. You know, we... I'll tell you a little story. So when we did our catalog early days, we, we, we used to sell, we don't sell it anymore, but we used to sell this fitness testing equipment. And there was these like things that you blow into, like a, that tested your respiratory, you know, you, like they were called... Um, lung capacity. Lung capacities, yeah. And then there was like uh, blood pressure monitors and, and uh, heart rate caliper and all this, you know, blood uh, fat calipers. It was a really boring section. And, and when you looked in all of our competitors' catalogs, they all looked the same really just boring fitness equipment. I used, to, I used to hate it, but we sold lots of it at the time. And so when we create our brochure, it's like, right, we need to do something different in this. We need to change it up. So I, I kind of had this idea. We went in, in London, there's this place called Soho. And it, it's, it's kind of like where you've got all the, the sex shops and the, the, the kind of peep shows and all that sort of stuff. And so we, the guy, my designer at the time, we went to Soho and I had this idea about this kind of nurse's outfit, like a uh, a sort of a red and white um, sort of plastic kind of, um, you know, shiny nurse's outfit. And we had this model who was this sort of six foot long blonde busty girl. So I brought these red, red high heel shoes, this tight kind of mini skirt nurse's outfit with a big cross on it. And then we kind of dressed her up in this and we got the, the lung, we, we put this sort of uh, the, the, the kind of Stuff heart rate around her, her here. So she was like a nurse. And she was blowing suggestively into the lung, <laughs> into the lung capacity. So it looked brilliant. It was it was fantastic. So we sent out these catalogs. I was really proud of it. It was very out of the box. And we, and then we had all our customers like from the lo- from the sort of government site saying, I was deeply offended by <laughs> by your catalog. But <clears throat> so it, you can make it, mistakes. Did it cost you any beers? It, it, it fortunately it didn't. And we reprinted them and we got over it. But but even you know years and years after people still talk about this i can't believe you did that nurse's outfit thing so you know sometimes at the time it was it was like my biggest disaster because i thought oh no i've blown that reputation you know but then afterwards people sort of get over it and then it you know it works out so when you take risks you are sometimes going to get it wrong but i think you've got to give it a try haven't you otherwise you're just the same as everybody else and you don't stand out dude that's a bomb now (laughs) now out of curiosity before we wrap it up what are you doing here in vegas i'm here to see you well not just this uh, yeah well come just for this did you i well it's two things I, I i we have a kind of mutual friend called dennis and um he was telling me about this great technology that you guys have and um and and you know i've i've, I've come to do the podcast but secondly i've come to see you know what it is that you guys do because we're in the we're in the education business as well with our primary business is product but secondary is we teach people how to use the product and um you know i understand that there's some really innovative ways for people to learn very effectively and you know we're just you know we, we're not in that space yet so i'm um you know i'm here sort of checking this out hmm. and then i'm going to drop into cocoon to see the cocoon water that we spoke about earlier as well dude that's and, crazy stuff uh, yeah. <laughs> i'm interested to see what you think about that yeah so 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 there's no there's no other purpose i thought maybe you're on a book tour or you're promoting some you know the podcast and by the way folks he's got his own podcast called escape your limits it's weekly where do they find it wherever podcasters are are, it's on itunes it's on youtube uh if you go to the escape fitness youtube channel you'll see the video version there or you can go onto itunes and um check it out there so it's a you know it's for anyone really in the fitness industry entrepreneurs investors trainers owners and we we kind of talk to people in that business about you know how they've 
developed, grown their business, new innovations in the space, that kind of stuff. So we've been going for a couple of years now. Damn. How many episodes? It, next week will be our hundredth episode and it'll be with Mark Mastroff, who is a kind of mutual, mutual friend. So you get, you get, well, again, I wish I could call him a friend. You can, <laughs> um, I know, I know of him obviously, but I've met him, uh, I think twice, but boy, that dude's a success. That's you're So you're getting like big dogs on your podcast. Yeah, we sort of we, we we get a mixture, but you know we'll get people that are we've had everyone from Mr. Olympias, you know we had Lee Haney and Dorian Yates to people like Mark Mastrov that have built and sold big corporations. And well, he and, he he's like part of the group that bought the UFC, absolutely, and that yeah. was four I think four billion dollar deal. <laughs> so Mark is like a freaking icon. He's like a no a lot of people never heard of his name, but they know a lot of his products. Yeah, and it's like damn dude, that's a good guy to have on. Yeah. Um, so listen, bomb squad, if you guys aren't following this guy, you should go to Instagram.com forward slash Matthew Janusek. Um, go check out escapefitness.com. You don't have a book to promote? No, I don't. Just, uh, yeah, not yet. Maybe. He, dude, he, folks, he ain't pitching nothing. He ain't <laughs> selling nothing. He just came through to check out Lightspeed, check out the cocoon thing. That this uh, and and we'll talk about that later on another podcast, but uh, he ain't here to sell you nothing, man. He just wants to freaking drop a few bombs and and uh, you know help help fellow entrepreneurs, man. Yeah, you've been and inspire them to sort of get, years. as I said in the beginning, you know, realize the importance of you know your your health and fitness to you know if you want to be a successful business person, you know that in terms of your the order of priority, you know that needs to be up the top because you know if you don't get that right. The rest of it is on shaky ground. And, you know, if you can do that through by using some of our products, then, uh, then that's cool as well. Well, where uh, do you, if people are listening, like, what do they do? Call their local facility and see if they have escape fitness equipment? Yeah, you can do that. Um, or you can just, you know, if you check, if you go to our website, escapefitness.com, you can kind of see what we're doing and where you, we are. There's a lot of our customers on the. Do you sell it to individuals too? We do, yeah. We've, we've got certain products that are for. You know, for the end users, we've got some cool things that you can use at home, like I do. You know, if you haven't got time to get to the gym, then there's some pretty cool stuff that you can do 20 minutes out in a park and you can get yourself in pretty decent shape. Well, that's what I want to get going because, again, dude, I, I don't want to go to a park because that takes just as much time as gym. I want to do it in my backyard and I don't want like a gym in my backyard. So it sounds like you have a couple of pieces of equipment that you can put away when you're done yeah absolutely yeah. what would you recommend i would say what i do my my workout when i'm not i like i like to go in a gym a few times because i just sometimes it's nice to get that boost and you know check out the atmosphere and the people and go and use the sauna but i'll do that a couple of times and then out of the sort of six times a week i work out i'll probably do four at home and so i've got a bulgarian bag I've got a pair of running shoes, so I'll kind of do some hill sprints and that just to get my heart rate up. I'll do the Bulgarian bag to give me some nice sort of explosive strength. I've got a cool product called the Vector, which which allows me to do all my sort of strength movement. And then I'll have a few dumbbells and a, and a barbell. And that, you know, you can do pretty much everything on, on those pieces of equipment. And that stuff's at escapefitness.com. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's, let's go. I'm going to, let's go to your website right now. I might get some stuff from you right <laughs> now, folks. Listen, go out, share, rate this podcast. If you ain't following Matthew, go do it now. Check out his stuff at escape fitness. Matthew, appreciate you coming in. Appreciate you dropping bombs, sharing the knowledge with the bomb squad. And, uh, we'll have you back anytime you're in Vegas. Let me know. We'll put, we'll, we'll bring you back on. I just like shooting the shit with you. <laughs> it's been, I've enjoyed it. You've, you've asked some questions I hadn't thought about for many years. Well, Thanks Brad. I appreciate uh, it. Dude. A lot of people say that they're like, dude, I wasn't prepared for this. Let me do another one. I'm like, <laughs> dude, we just shot. We just, we just, you know, had a little conversation. That's all bomb squad. Appreciate your support. I love the reviews and the ratings. Go give me a few until next time. Keep it real. <laughs>